Welcome to today's live learning, how to avoid duplicating a problem situation with another. How to avoid duplicating really one problem situation with another, just substituting one with another. I'm Peggy O'Neill. I'm the founder of this Facebook group, Answering the Call, and I'm happy you're here today. If you're here live, please say hi and ask any comments, uh, ask any questions, make any comments, uh, and I will address them while we're together. And if you're watching this on replay, please put in hashtag replay in the same comments, questions. I will respond. Love seeing them. And uh, and as the founder of Answering the Call, uh, what the reason for this group is that we're here, most of us experience some sort of longing in our life. We don't feel quite fulfilled. And in actuality, that feeling of longing, lack of fulfillment is actually an invitation. It's a call, if you will. It's inviting us to come home to ourselves, to know who we truly are, the one being that we are, not separate from anyone or anything. In fact, we share our being with everyone and everything. And then usually once we answer that call, and know more fully and deeply who we are in an experiential way, not intellectually, then we also start discovering what we're here that's uniquely ours to express, to contribute, to share. So that's what we do here in the group. And these calls every week, these sessions every week are to support us in knowing more fully who we are, living as who we truly are, and knowing what we're here to express. So I'll see if there's anybody here. Hi, Sharon. Thank you for being here. I'm very glad you're here. So how to avoid duplicating a problem situation with another. So, and, and so we'll start by talking about why and how it is likely that one problem will be replaced with another in a family or, organi or an organization. So why it happens is that you can think of an organization or a family like this. Let me make sure you can see this pretty well. Let's see. There you go. It's a system. And everything interacts with every, somehow everybody's connected to everybody in the system. Looks like I missed one or two here. You can think that everyone is interconnected. Everyone influences everything in the system, everybody in the system and it is just is connected whether it looks like it or not they may be in an organization in a totally separate building but because you're all in the organization everybody is connected now we can bring it cl more close to home for purposes of this conversation will make more sense you can think of your own office or department or your family that everything is intimately connected everyone as well as every system every meeting Everything is set up to, and interconnected, and everything is there to support what's there. Let that sink in. Everything is there to support whatever is going on in the organization and to have it be the way that it is. So think about it. If everything's uh, intertwined, entangled, uh, then everything is supporting this particular system to stay where it is. So if one person in the situation, or maybe it's a computer system, but there's one thing in the organization that isn't working well, but here we're talking specifically about people, then we think, well, if I just pulled, sorry, this, this is not a mirror, <laughs> mirror image, so I have to, Figure out where I am. So when you, if I took just took out this, then it leaves a hole in that space. It leaves a hole in that space. And naturally, that space wants to be filled with something similar that was there before. Just naturally wants to happen. Because what was there was part of the system. Now, so what all does that mean that it's part of the system? So how it happens that all of that's entangled the way that it is and that the system wants to maintain exactly what's there 
is things like conversations we have. So when there's a person in particular in an organization that people are going, oh, we don't like this person. Oh, this person isn't doing well. One time I was coaching, teaching uh, a, a, a quite a few, 20, let's say, government county officials how to coach. They all complained about this one person. What were they going to do about this one person? And there was so much energy and conversation and he was the bad guy and he was a problem that that system was going to have to maintain that energy that dynamic that there's somebody that's wrong and bad because where are those conversations going to go they don't just evaporate if you get rid of somebody we're used to having them we're used to complaining about somebody we're used to saying he's the problem so we're going to naturally find a new person. If it's not a person in the same position, which sometimes it actually is. Sometimes I've worked with organizations where, where they actually replace this person thinking there's no way whatever happens next is going to be the same. And lo and behold, it is. I'm not kidding. At a law firm where somebody was causing doing some unethical things. And they thought, well, there's no way we're going to hire somebody else that does unethical things. Well, guess what? <laughs> it's just the nature of the beast. Now, it didn't necessarily have to be that, that it was that obvious or that, um, that, I mean, I tried to talk them out of it. I tried to say what I'm about to say to you all. But sometimes, like in that case, they really needed somebody in that position. So they thought they could, they could hire somebody and, and, and rectify the situation later. But unless we do what I'm going to suggest in a minute, then the odds are higher. We're going to, it's going to be a similar energy, a similar vibration, if you will, similar conversations. It's just going to happen that we find somebody similar to put in that position. So, um, so uh, let's see, I was going to say something. Um, so, oh, so back to conversations. So we get used to having those sorts of conversations and we have to keep them up because that's our habit that's our habit and and the energy is such there's some some allowing in the organization let's say for somebody to be unethical now everybody else wasn't unethical it wasn't that but a lot of people weren't having respectful conversations about other people they weren't doing some of the things on time and, and having meetings in the way that they wanted to. So just things like that that are these undercurrents of conversations that allow for something like that to happen. Plus, another habit in the organization is that we, we love to complain about somebody or something. So the, back to that county that I worked with, it was amazing to me that all 20 of these people knew this person and knew he was a problem. It's that, that it, frankly, keeps us from looking at ourselves. We don't have to look at ourselves. How am I part of this problem? Well, continuing to have the conversations are part of the system. That's part of one of those dots that are on that piece of paper. The conversations are part of that system. It keeps the thing in place. So it happens through conversations, it happens through just our natural, and because of how organizations have been managed and run for a long time, we tend to want to find somebody to gossip about, somebody to have a story about, somebody that's getting all the negative energy because we want to put it somewhere. Um, and, and so then what do you do to avoid repeating it? Well, so like what this law firm didn't do and again they really wanted somebody they needed somebody in that position so they actually did the best that they could it just <laughs> it just happened because the other changes didn't happen soon enough but how do you avoid repeating it first is to notice we're having these conversations and to also notice how long they put up with that situation it had been going on for a while so that's another way to know that it's just in the system it's like in the water it's going to be maintained. It's going to be sustained. You probably heard the universe abhors a vacuum. It becomes a vacuum. And it's going to get replaced with something very similar unless we're consciously being aware of what we're talking about. We're doing so, yes. So how to avoid it happening again? Well, we observe what we're doing, what we're talking about, and then we change our conversations. That means internally have some meetings uh, or 
uh, yeah, meetings are the best way, or at least one-on-one conversations, with acknowledging that we've been gossiping about this person, that we haven't done anything about this person, and start talking about how do we want the culture to be different? How do we want to be different with people? Who else are we talking about behind their back? Let's stop those conversations as well. What kind of person, what, what do we want to be looking for in this person that we hire? What were the red flags that we didn't pay attention to? Maybe include those in the interview process. I mean, some questions around the red flags that would help reveal what their um, ethics were, their moral standards are. So that you, it, it, so that was that particular person. Other people, it can just be they're a problem because they, um, they're, they're not nice to people. Okay, well, how did we hire people that aren't nice to people? What, what in our culture allowed that to happen? What do we think about people? What, um, what are different conversations we can have? How can we interview somebody or really watch for them not being nice? And then how do we make sure we don't keep those conversations going by unwittingly now picking out another not nice person to talk about? It, it happens. I promise you it happens. So that's how to, how to not repeat it is you, you, real, you recognize and allow yourself to recognize the conversations and the activities that go on um, that keep it in place. And because otherwise they will be repeated because we love our habits. Um, you can also look at the, um, the mood of that person, the mood of the organization, um, so depending like for that one where it was an ethical issue, what's the mood? If there's kind of an underlying mood of dissatisfaction, um, then that can contribute to, we got to find somebody to put that mood on. So noticing the mood and then how do we change the mood rather than giving it all to one person that we, um, you know, start having other conversations that shift the mood. So other conversations, maybe it's about goals in the organization or respecting people or uh, so you start shifting the conversations. Um, also, another thing that can keep it in place is that it's okay to complain instead of doing something about the situation. Um, also, people like to get distracted from work. So maybe taking breaks instead of having um, um, gossip conversations. We just like to get distracted. And in fact, it's useful. You know, they say, don't sit around and be on a computer too long. Get up, walk around, move. So the same sort of thing, um, give ourselves opportunities to take breaks so that we don't use uh, people as the, um, as the scapegoat for needing a distraction. Uh, so we have to stay vigilant, vigilant in organizations, vigilant when these sorts of things start coming up and we start becoming aware of them. And, and if we start having a problem with a the person, then as soon as we start having a problem, to begin to address it so that it doesn't become uh, an infection in the organization. So I'll see if there are any questions or comments and if this is making sense. So Sharon, something else happens in these situations. Rather than talking directly to the person who is causing a problem, the others tend to talk about him or her with one another. The real issue is never addressed. Exactly, Sharon. Exactly. Part of that is, you know, I give it to all of us. We've never been um, given the education for how to address these situations. So we feel uncomfortable talking to people. We haven't developed the kind of skills to have uncom uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations with uncomfortable situations and people. Um and, and at some level, we think once we've hired them, that somehow it should just all work. And yet in most organizations, people never have a, like a real conversation. They're often told, here's the mission of the organization, here's what we're up to. But to allow people to speak as well to why it matters to them to work there, why they're there, why are we, why are we together as a team? How do we want to work together as a team? How do we want to treat each other? Those are often conversations that are missing when we hire somebody. We just bring them in, we plop them down. Instead of everybody getting together, can be a small group if it's a small team, or could be the whole organization. You know, how we work together. How do we want to be with each other? What matters to us? So that um, um, 
you're you're creating an organization where people are caring about each other and and talking like not just talking about not just gossiping or 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 in letting people know that we address issues and doing that and again getting better at how to do that okay um so in review so how to uh, uh, how to avoid duplicating a problem situation and just repeating it with another one is to recognize that if we've got a situation, yes, we want to address it, but then we want to be aware that this has been. The, now, if it, if it happens, like you hired somebody and a week later, you can already see that that's, that's going to be a problem situation, then you want to address it right then. And then it may not be much of an issue within the culture. It just may have something to do with the hiring process. But most of the times when I run into this, they've, it's just gone on and on and on for years. And so when that's happened, then that's when you've got to look at everything that I'm talking about today is that, uh, it, it, you know, it happens because we've, we've let it seep in. We let it continue. Um, we love distractions at, in the workplace. People complain. That becomes okay. People gossip. That becomes okay. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's because we haven't addressed the culture overall. How do we want to work together? So it's just kind of a nebulous, we're supposed to all get along or something. Instead of talking about how do we create the culture that we want, how do we do that, what do we want, so that it becomes, the that's the water, if you will, and not some default behavior in the organization. And, and then again, we think sometimes, well, I can just get rid of them and put somebody else in there and it'll all be fine. I hope you're seeing, because of this conversation, that's just not how it works because now we've created whole systems of communication and it's okay to complain about somebody and um, that um, uh, okay not to address the situation. So all the various things that are keeping that in place and we avoid repeating it, like I said, by really looking at what are our conversations, how are we treating each other, how do we want to be and starting to shift those conversations. So that's fine. Really, this happens in all organizations. This, you have done nothing wrong. It's just we haven't been, We most people don't understand what we're talking about today. They just don't. And then they don't know how to address it. So either way, if you want some support with this, I'm available, of course, to, to help you with a particular situation and then how not to repeat it again. All you have to do is reach out and we'll schedule a time. I can, I'm happy to have a complimentary conversation about this with anybody at any time. All right, I'll see if there are any co other comments or questions. All right, thank you so much for being here, Sharon, and for contributing to this conversation. And uh, let's see, oh, Sharon, this can be translated to all relationships, friends, family. If I only share my concerns with someone other than the person with whom I have a problem, then the issue continues. That's part of the reason some marriages just don't work. We look to someone outside ourselves to make things better. Consequently, I can divorce and remarry someone just like the person I divorced. Yes, <laughs> exactly, Sharon. That invariably happens. They have a different name and a different face, but they wind up being the same person. Yes, exactly. I'm glad you said that because I think I briefly said at the beginning that this can happen not just in organizations, but in, in uh, friend systems, if you will, uh, family systems, if you will. It's all the same thing. It's one system. It's all, everything's interconnected. And so, uh, so you can't just take one thing out and think everything will shift around. It's just not how it works. It's going to get replaced with something very similar to what was there before. And um, so, let's see. So the other thing I'll add is in the Facebook group, I know some of you are watching this on YouTube, I posted this week, that the ongoing praxis is now going to have a concentrated period of time of taking on how do we know that we're in, inherently a healthy being? And then how do we align our beliefs about health, our beliefs about disease, our beliefs about problem issues in our body? And how do we align all that so that we can possibly heal ourselves. There are lots of work out there these days about s some ways to heal ourselves. And so we're going to be exploring that and not just intellectually, we're going to be practicing that. So if that's of interest to you, 
healing our bodies, healing ourselves. And sometimes it isn't healing the body. We don't know how the healing is going to occur. Sometimes it is the body. Often it is. And then sometimes it's not the body, but it's healing our being in a way that we feel healed, even if the body still uh, uh, reveals some um, some issues. So if you're interested in that, please contact me. We would love for you to join us on the, the Praxis journey and then this particular element of it that we're bringing in. You're welcome, Sharon. Thank you for being here. And thank you, everybody. Bye.